Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this first plenary session of today. And it's a great pleasure and honor for me to, to be chairing it. Uh, as you're probably aware, we've had to change the format of the session because Sally, uh, sadly, S Sally Sattel can't be with us because of illness. So we, we, we've rethought how it might be arranged. And uh, Parashkev, whom I'll introduce in a second, and I have decided that he will talk a little bit longer than he'd originally planned, probably uh, 40 minutes. Then he and I will have a sort of structured discussion for 20 minutes, and then we'll throw it open to the people uh, for the for the for the Q and A in the usual way. Um, actually, Parashkev is an ideal speaker for this session for all sorts of reasons. First of all, we've been circling round neuroscience. We've had some good neuroscience, but on the whole, the neuroscience has been treated as an object rather than a person. We now have uh, neuroscience in person, and. Um, uh, you, you will get a much clearer idea, those of you who are not neuroscientists, of, from what Parashka is going to say, of its limitations, its possibilities, and possibly its, its, its metaphysical relevance or otherwise. Um, as, as regards Parashka's credentials, he is one of the emergent figures in UK neuroscience. He's currently a clinical lecturer at the Institute of Neurology at UCL, which is the, although, I come, although I'm a, a Manchester academic, I have to say it is the one of the, it is the leading center in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's honorary clinical, clinical lecturer there at the Faculty of Medicine in Imperial College London, and he divides his time between clinical neurology and cognitive neuroscience. So that's one of his credentials, but in addition, he is also philosophically very interested and very sophisticated, and more to the point, he's collaborated with, with Peter Hacker uh, on, on a paper on covert cognition in, in persistent vegetative state. So in many ways, he's a very important link between philosophy and, uh, and, and neuroscience. I was going to say he's a sort of synapse between the two, but that was slightly sort of tilted towards, uh, towards the neuroscientific side. So with, with great pleasure, I introduce Parashkev to you. Give his talk. Thank you very much, Ray, for this. I have to say it's, it is difficult for me to defend neuroscience because I'm perhaps... <coughs> Uh, one of relatively few neuroscientists who believes that there are very many and very deep conceptual errors throughout neuroscience. And I have to say, I think it's an, there is an urgent need within neuroscience for people to, uh, to address the very detailed and specific criticisms that have been made of neuroscience, particularly in Peter Hacker's book with Max Bennett on the philosophical foundations of neuroscience. We've heard about the neurological fallacy, but really that's only one aspect of the really very numerous criticisms that he makes in that book, and each of those needs to be taken specifically and looked at in detail. And that is something that we need to do in order to make progress in neuroscience, and uh, I'm sad to say that many of my colleagues feel that this is something that can simply be bypassed. But the reality is that conceptual flaws, although distinct from the empirical side, do have empirical consequences, so we cannot ignore them. If we construct an experiment in a way that's conceptually flawed, then the data that's generated from it is completely useless. Now, I don't think it should be any surprise that neuroscientists are bad at philosophy. It's not what we've been trained to do. Uh, we've been trained to do something completely different, uh, and yet we have to do it because, of course, we cannot escape the concept. It's part of what we do, but it's not something for which we have training. Equally, philosophers are not generally speaking, trained to interpret neuroscientific data. And often they're quite quick to move on to the abstractions, the generalities, the wood rather than the trees, but um, that can actually lead them astray. And I just wanted very briefly to come back to an experiment that's been referred to several times already, uh, which is uh, an experiment done by John Haynes's group uh, that relates to the Libet task that we've already discussed in detail. So this is an experiment in which subjects were asked to make a choice, either left or right, and then what the experimenter showed was that they could use functional imaging in order to predict which way the choice would be made in advance of the time that the subject said he had actually made the choice. So here's the actual data, which no one's actually shown us yet, uh, or rather plots of the data. So here's the timeline here, that these are plots for different areas. This is for this area within frontal lobe, this one is for this area, and that's for the back here. So the x-axis is time, uh, 
Zero is the time at which they supposedly make the decision to go left or right. And then what you're seeing here plotted is the probability of the machine, this is a, a classifier statistical machine, predicting based on the imaging which way the subject will go on any one trial. And the critical thing to appreciate is that the maximum accuracy of the system was about 60%. So it is only slightly better than chance in guessing which way you're going to go. So this is very far from determinism. Also, if you actually look at the details of the methods, you will find that 36 subjects were initially evaluated for the task, of which only 14 were used. And the ones that were used satisfied a specific requirement, which is that when they were making these choices, freely choosing left and right, they balanced their distribution of choices, so it was sometimes left, sometimes right. Now, they didn't tell them, please, can you balance your responses so that they look random, because if they had done that, this would mean that they would have to keep track of the distribution of button selections in memory and then be pre-planning of actions and so on. So instead, what they did is that they simply selected subjects that spontaneously chose to do that. But what does spontaneously choosing to do that really mean? It means that they simply implicitly knew that they would look really stupid if they just went left, 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 left. <laughs> and even more stupid if they went left, right, left, right. And so what they were doing inevitably, because people can't respond randomly, they were pseudo-randomizing. So all that this data shows is that there is a slight bias in the functioning Im imaging signal that is entirely consistent with the subjects thinking about producing a pseudo-random sequence. And of course, they're thinking about how to pseudo-randomize the sequence well in advance of making the movement or making the decision. Sorry, can I ask you to speak up, please? Sorry, maybe we can increase the gain on the microphone, or perhaps I'll just move closer to it. So the conclusion of all of this is that the data falls short of the philosophy, a long way short of the philosophy. And we don't really need to draw these momentous conclusions from this paper because that's not what the paper shows. The paper is much more modest. But let me return to the question of what it is the brain imaging can usefully show in general about human beings. And for this purpose, I'd like to begin with a, a, an assumption about how human beings are defined or characterized, rather. And it seems to me that it's reasonable to argue that human beings are principally what they do. We are animated things, and we are defined by what we do, primarily. You can take a simple object <coughs> that's defined functionally, a watch. So it doesn't matter whether a watch is a quartz watch or a mechanical watch. We call it a watch if it keeps the time. To tell the time, all we have to do is look at the watch. To want to look at the mechanism seems an impossibly <coughs> nerdy thing to do. Why would you want to flip it on its back, open, have a look inside the mechanism? It just seems irrelevant. Of course, if the watch is broken, that might be the only way that you can start, start it running again. And the corollary of that in medicine would be that this is when uh, people become patients that we decide to look at the mechanism. But in general, looking at the mechanism, there's something distasteful, something nerdy about it. And you can see that somebody who's obsessed with the mechanism might commit all sorts of conceptual errors. So for example, here's the horological, mirrorological fallacy. Time is in this wheel here, uh, which of course is not. Time is given by the watch. Here's the horological libit paradigm. <laughs> and so on. Now, a watch, of course, is too simple a model. All that a watch does is it just tells the time. And human beings do a lot more. So what do human beings do? Well, here are some, some verbs that I've picked at random. And what is notable about the things that we do is that we choose one thing that we do as being primary above all others, and that is talk. We use language. And surely it's right that it should be so, that the fact that we use language is what primarily distinguishes us 
from other animals. However, that doesn't mean that language speaking, giving and taking reasons, that aspect of us dependent on language has to be what characterizes us comprehensively. So just as the neurological fallacy in neuroscience is that the brain is not a limiting case of a human being, or the argument against it rather, so one might argue that there may be a neurological fallacy in the humanities uh, if one claims that a person is a limiting case of a human being. It may be that although that aspect of us that gives and takes reasons is <coughs> supremely important, it doesn't necessarily have to be hierarchically arranged with everything else that we do. Everything else that we do need not necessarily follow from that aspect of us that gives and takes reasons. So it may be that that arrangement where the person, the aspect of a human being that is responsive to reasons uh, does not have a kind of hierarchical connection with all the other aspects of a human being. And of course, there are elements of that that one can see just looking at the way that human beings behave. And so, of course, it's tempting for theorists of one kind or another to interpose all these adventitious layers between that aspect of us that's accessible in language and the aspect of us that isn't. So we have discussions of the subconscious, deep structures of very kind of theory that's interposed in between those two. It may be that, as Wittgenstein says, words are deeds, which is not to say that they're merely deeds, but that they're not hierarchically arranged, that the aspect of us that speaks sits side by side with the aspects of us that do other things. That is an empirical claim. And so it's empirically, be empirically testable, potentially. And what I want to show you is some evidence that actually that might be how human beings are built. So here is a, uh, a famous patient known only as DF, who fortunately was unsuccessful in attempting to kill herself by putting her head in the oven in the days when that was sometimes successful. The only result was that she ended up with damage to the lateral occipital cortex on both sides of her brain. The consequence of this is that she became functionally blind. So if you show her this figure here of an apple and say to her, what is this? She's unable to name it. If you say to her, can you copy it? She can't. She just does, does not see it. The same is true of a book here. This is her attempt to draw a book. This isn't because she doesn't understand the concept of an apple or because she can't draw. It's because she's able to draw an apple from memory and the same is true of a book. So Milne and Goodale in the early 90s studied this woman in detail and they asked her to do the following task. They showed her a slot on a panel in front of her that was vertically orientated like this. And then they did this repeatedly with different orientations. And they asked her to guess what the orientation of the slot was and to arrange another slot in front of her so that it matched that slot. This is how controls performed. They were perfect, as you might imagine. But she was a chance. So the difference between the orientation of what she was seeing and the orientation of what she matched um, was uh, essentially random. In the critical part of the experiment, however, they said to her, here's a letter, post it through the slot. And this was her performance. So she was able to perform the posting task without any difficulty at all. So in this woman, conscious perception of seeing for report is sharply dissociated from seeing for action. That part of her that guides her movements, is visually guides her movements in a very detailed and sophisticated way, is separable from the part of her that allows her to report them. Now you might say, well, this is a very, very simple behavior. Posting is, is too simple an action. Uh, and it may well be true that some very simple actions can be performed without engaging that uh, aspect of us that connects with language. 
but you can show similar effects for much more complex behaviors. So here's an experiment that uh, showed a phenomenon that has been termed choice blindness. So here we have a cartoon that shows you uh, what the experiment involves. Here we have the experimenter, and in front of him is sitting, I'm seeing here, the subject. The experimenter shows you two photographs, uh, of uh, a photograph of, of a woman, of two different women. The subject is male, and he's asked to say which of these two women he prefers, as in the sense of who does he think is more attractive. So he points. Then the experimenter puts the card down and gives it to him. But he does a little sleight of hand such that the card that he's actually given is not the card that he chose, but the opposite one. And then he's asked to justify why he made the choice that he made. Now, you would have thought that most people would look at the card and you'd say, are you kidding me? What is this? You've just given me the other card. But they don't. What happens is that actually the vast majority of subjects, even when they're given unlimited time to look at the cards before they make the choice, do not detect that there has been a swap in the card. And instead, they rationalize, sometimes at length, why it is that they chose the card that they didn't choose. So making a choice and rationalizing it appear not to be always the same. That aspect of us that makes the choice need not be that which rationalizes what choice is made. Let me give one final example. This is from some work that I've been carrying out with a collaborator of mine, Professor Brian Strange in Madrid. And this involves a common human behavior, gambling. Now, there is an area of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, that is crudely thought of as being somehow involved in connecting emotion to action. And if one asks subjects to perform some kind of gambling task in the scanner, the degree of activity within that area appe appears to correlate with whether or not the choice being made is risky or safe. So when subjects make risky choices, when they gamble, they have more activation in this region than when uh, they make safe choices. So we studied patients in whom, for a completely different disorder, for obsessive compulsive disorder, we have electrodes inserted into the nucleus accumbens that allows it to put current into that area and disrupt or stimulate its activity. So we designed a very simple task where we could manipulate on any particular trial the degree of risk and the amount of reward that the subject received. So he could choose to either play safe or go for the risky option as a proportion of a variable probability of being rewarded. So normal subjects and this subject with the electrode off would have this kind of pattern of behavior. So on the x-axis here, we have the probability of being rewarded on the trial. And then on the y-axis is the probability of the subject choosing that particular, the risky option on any trial. So in the high-risk condition, where the probability of reward is low, but if they do get a reward, it's high, it's a large amount. And most people don't bother because the probability is too low. Where the probability of reward is high, then they tend to go for the risky option because they get that they're likely to be rewarded. And there is some continuous function that describes smoothly the relationship in the intermediate values. Now, the moment to switch on the electrode in this patient, she suddenly starts behaving in a completely different way. She now starts choosing the risky and unlikely option. And if you speak to her and you say to her, what are you doing? She says, well, I, it's, just, it's just what I'm doing. She doesn't rationalize in any way. She doesn't explain it. She just says, well, that's, that's just how I want to play the game. And then you switch the electrode off, and she's back to normal. So we're able to manipulate her behavior in a very specific and very focused way because the rest of her behavior is unaffected by this manipulation. 
without invoking the person in any way. So it seems to me that there are interpretations of this data that would seem to be consistent with thinking of that aspect of us that deals in language and the aspect of us that doesn't as running in parallel. That isn't to say that one cannot influence the other, but at least in terms of how they're organized within the brain, they don't necessarily follow a serial hierarchical structure. And the question is, where does brain activation fall within that scheme? Well, it seems to me that it also sits side by side in parallel to, uh, to, to those other aspects. So one can conceive a functional activation of the brain a little bit like an involuntary bodily response. An equally structural variation in the brain is like the variation in a constitutive bodily feature. So for example, one might imagine that the activation of the brain is an involuntary response, just like blushing is an involuntary response. It's context specific, it's related to what somebody is doing. It may be informative about whether or not the subject is embarrassed. It might not be. And functional activation is exactly like that. Similarly, structural features of the brain may relate to powers that the subject has or does not have, just in the same way that, for example, the circumference of your arm might be an indicator of whether or not you're strong or you're weak. Whether or not any particular part of the body or changes, involuntary changes that happen within it, happen to be informative, is something that has to be determined case by case. Sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't. Now, we tend to conceal many parts of our bodies, and we often conceal parts of our bodies that have involuntary responses. So maybe part of the resistance uh, to revealing the brain is a kind of modesty. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a perfectly reasonable, uh, reasonable um, way of thinking about it. But it, that is not a scientific matter. That's, that's an anthropological matter. And the reason why sometimes we have to overcome that modesty is there are circumstances in which it is helpful to think about the, the significance, particularly I think of structural changes in the brain. Imagine that you have somebody who's paraplegic. You know that he's unable to walk, and you tell him you must run. You would not consider his failure to run a moral failure. He doesn't run because he cannot run. He does not have the power to run because he's paraplegic. Now imagine the case of a man who is unable to behave, to act morally, because the substrate on which being able to act morally depends is simply missing from his brain. His frontal lobes are damaged, and therefore he simply does not have the power to act morally. Saying to somebody like this, why don't you act morally, would seem to be, well, quite simply cruel, just as it would be cruel to ask somebody who's paraplegic why they can't run. Now, of course, in order to establish the relation between damage to a specific part of the brain and an incapacity to perform a certain behavior or to do something, one has to be led by the behavior. It is always the behavior that trumps what happens structurally. It's inevitable. That is how you establish the association between the function of a, of a or the, the, the possible function of a particular region of the brain. But nonetheless, I can see circumstances in which knowing that, once the association had been established, you would be in a better position to judge whether or not what someone's doing is appropriately being judged as a moral failure. In fact, the better in general that we know the body, the better we can properly isolate that aspect of us that is properly considered as a person. Because the attacks on the conception of a human being as a person come precisely from these outlying cases where somebody behaves in a way that is profoundly amoral and therefore it seems like it's a moral failure. The papers, for example, are full of stories of various atrocities that have been committed by people, but nobody ever 
looks into those cases, and a very large number of them are simply because that person has become insane. They've developed psychosis or they have some other problem. And so they've become patients. They've ceased, ceased to be agents. Now, that is obviously true only of some. And of others, it is appropriate to think of them as moral agents. But the criterion of whether or not that is the correct thing to do is really responsiveness to being given reasons. It's responsiveness to being treated as a person. And when that responsiveness simply does not exist because one does not have the neural substrate on which it could possibly be supported, then it is right to set those cases aside and say, look, here it's no longer an agent, it is a patient, and that's how we need to think of it. So in summary, I'd like to say that only part of us is explicable in terms of language, in terms of reason giving and reason uh, taking. There are parts of us that are explicable only in terms of brain responses and other bodily responses. And to be clear about the former, which is by far the most important thing, it helps to be clearer about the latter. And that is where neuroscience can be of use. Stop there. A beautiful and rich talk, beautifully delivered. So a little bit of conversation between Parash Kev and myself and then throw it over to the people. I want to go through some sort of headlines of this. Actually, there isn't anything wrong with the statistics, uh, and he, you know, he, he actually did a very good job with this paper in terms of the statistical rigor. The issue is the interpretation, and he he's actually much more measured in the way that he interprets the data than those who have used the paper thereafter to build all sorts of uh, philosophical speculations. So he he's clear in the paper that it's slightly better than chance. Okay, the issue of pseudo-randomization is something we've had discussions about that, and you know, he, he thinks of it slightly differently. But the failure here is not of the methodology. The failure here is the way in which the data is interpreted. So part of the problem is not being sufficiently uh, clear about what the data actually is. Now, there is a huge amount of, uh, uh, of, of temptation on us to present our papers in a way that makes them sexy. I'm sorry, but this is how it is, and even the best of us succumb to this. One of my papers was reported in the Times as Imperial College scientists discover the seat of the will. I didn't encourage it. Uh, I did try to discourage it, but uh, it's difficult because that's how journalists often write it up. That's what their readers want, and that's how they pitch it. And I think here the, the failure is not so much John's as the interpretation, and that—that that is, I think, what what needs to be, uh, what needs to be focused on. Just pursuing that further, then, uh, say a philosophical audience who wants to learn as much as possible from neuroscience, really should go armed to the teeth, just as they would just arguing with a fellow philosopher, uh, and perhaps even go back to the original papers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just as there are no small errors in logic, there are no small errors in, in neuroscience. You have to know it in detail. There is no other option. Thank you. Well, I'm sure there'll be methodological discussion uh, 
later on. Um, I want to move on to your next uh, part of your paper, which is saying, talk about humans and what they do. And one of the things I think came over very beautifully in your talk was what a mistake it is to understand what people do in terms of the mechanisms by which they do it. And I wanted to ask really, does that give you some general handle on the extent to which we can learn about what we do from seeing brain mechanisms, for example? I mean, you gave some beautiful examples, but can you give us some general, as it were, guides? So the one misleading aspect of the example of the watch is, of course, a brain is not a mechanism in the way that a watch mechanism is a mechanism. A brain is infinitely more complex. And I don't think there's a problem with saying that it is based on physical principles, but also saying that it's so complex that we're never going to be able to model it deterministically. We, we, we won't. There are too many cells, there are too many connections. Even if you were turn, to turn the entire universe into computing power, you still won't be able to model it. Is that a statement about our lack of knowledge or about the reality? It's a statement about the complexity of the thing that we're dealing with. So it is knowable, but it just won't be known by us or, in fact, by anything that exists within the known universe because it's just too complex. And to press but you further, so if we did have complete knowledge, we would discover that it was deterministic, that we are parts of a larger deterministic system. Perhaps. Perhaps. It would never be perfectly deterministic because, of course, there's always chance in these things. But the question becomes academic in the pejorative sense because it is so complex. There are so many connections, so many cells. Um, and, and what we try to do in neuroscience is to gain limited insights by spotting some general patterns and trying to build some models that seem to have some explanatory power. And yes, sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. But we're never going to have a comprehensive understanding of the brain as a deterministic model. It will never happen. You said the brain isn't a mechanism. Are there mechanisms within the brain that it's fruitful to look at? I mean, just to excuse the bits I know, can we think about <coughs> parts of the brain being mechanisms, modules, or whatever you like? Well, if we take an isolated uh, uh, circuit, we can certainly find that we can describe its properties, the properties of that specific part, reasonably well. We can fit a good model to it, sure. And that is a satisfying thing to do, and sometimes it seems to have explanatory power in relation to how that specific unit works. And sometimes that has utility in terms of coming up with ways of being able to treat patients and to change the way in which they function. But those tend to be limited, focal. You find something here, something there, but it seems to make sense. And often when you try to embed it within the, the bigger picture, you find that actually it becomes much trickier to understand how it all functions. But nonetheless, I think understanding limited parts of the brain is helpful and interesting. It does raise the question, though, if you, as it were, fractionate the person into a set of modules or whatever, there then comes a great problem of how it all comes together. And I was just thinking, and there was also counting modules. I was thinking what Barry said the other day, that there are, I've forgotten how many sensors. How many sensors are there, Barry? 57? 23. 23. And, and in a way that... Um, the, the mechanisms you see, the modules you observe, are not things that correspond to natural kinds. They're very mm. much influenced by the way, the language we use, of course, mm. to think about ourselves already. But So that's one problem. But the other problem is how it all comes together, mm. the sense of it coming together. Sure. I mean, it's, we must be clear that much of this fractionation is actually driven by the data, as it were. It's not models, fractional models that we impose on it, that is just how people are. So, for example, you can get a visual agnosia that's specific to a particular class of object. That tells you that there is an organization within the brain such that the dependence on being able to recognize certain categories tends to follow categories in the real world. So somebody might be incapable of recognizing flowers, but is able to recognize other things. So some of the seeming modularity, just as, it, for example, it's possible to knock out somebody's ability to perceive color or to perceive motion. Right? So some of this modularity that you see, we've had a lot of it, comes from just the way that the brain is. But the fact that it's modular doesn't mean that you have to have some mechanisms that puts all these modules together. 
all that is required is for them to function synchronously, simultaneously, so as to present a coherent picture in the human being as a whole. The fact that they happen to be modular, I don't think is a problem. We don't need something to bind them all together. They develop in such a way that they produce a uniform picture at the human being level. But that's just how it is. Driven by the data. It's quite interesting to say that. That assumes that one approaches the data innocently and so on. But it, I, I just wonder, to taking your example of um, somebody may have visual agnosia just for flowers. So do you think there's a flower perception center? Well, that's exactly the step I would make. Yeah. I wouldn't say just because this person cannot recognize flowers, there is a flower center. In fact, there's a, <laughs> there's a debate in the literature about an area of the, of the brain called the fusiform frame, uh, face area that responds to faces. So for a long time, there was speculation in this area is designed for faces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, if you take people who are obsessed with cars and you scan them, when you show them, show them cars, they get activation in exactly the same area. <laughs> and you get that even if they're looking at the cars side on. So it's not as if cars have face-like fronts, which they do to some degree. They have eyes and things. Um, and it, it, all it tells us is the fusiform face area is specialized. Well, it's not special. It's, it's active whenever somebody's looking at something where one has a great deal of visual expertise. We have expertise in faces because we spend our lives looking at faces. Some people spend their lives looking at cars. Their fusiform area is taken over by cars. I think it's a really subversive observation because the idea of a face area has been mobilized very much in the literature, uh, basically of, of, of uh, the literature that seems to uh, focus on the idea that for evolutionary reasons, we have certain, as it were, uh, congenital propensities. The fact that this area can be appropriated by motor cars is, I think, a very subversive observation. And I think um, we might well discuss this. And sort of, uh, yes. Thank you. So coming on to the very interesting experiments you talked about, about people st being stimulated in the nucleus accumbens. These are people, as you mentioned, who have um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I guess they can cope with it better because the nucleus stimulating nucleus accumbens makes them feel more relaxed about things. Perhaps. So that the observation about the gambling may well be the case that just as you make them more relaxed about crossing the road and about going outside, you also make them more relaxed about taking risks. So it's really almost a confirmatory thing of the treatment in a sort of way. Is that right? Perhaps, yes. Yeah. But um, do you think it undermines our sense of, as it were, being agents any more than the fact that if you take two pints of beer, you're more likely to behave differently on the risk-benefit trade-off? Yes, the, I, I'm not suggesting that, that 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 undermines treating somebody as an agent. All I'm suggesting is that the relation between our actions and everything else that goes on needn't necessarily go through that part of us that would cite a reason or take reasons in what we do. It doesn't have to be so. The fact that we can bypass it means that there cannot be a linear connection, they, they run in parallel. That doesn't mean that they cannot connect in some way. It doesn't mean that you cannot, for example, encourage somebody to stop gambling simply by talking to them. But it does mean that neurobiologically, they are separate, they run in parallel. And what is interesting about this is that it is such a specific effect. So when you speak to this patient during stimulation, otherwise unchanged. It's mm. only this aspect of her behavior that is altered. The connection between risk and reward. Um, and it's that specificity that shows you that, I think, unsurprisingly, that all of those behaviors have their own substrate. <coughs> and they have their own, they, they run in parallel. They're not, it's not a serial organization. Is the fact that she was participating in a game rather than in real life and not you know, betting the house and the farm and so on, do you think that makes the experiment less relevant to everyday life and to addictive or non-addictive behavior or risk-taking behavior? I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, it, it is often a problem that we can only do experiments in certain circumstances. For example, all of functional imaging, nearly all of functional imaging, is done lying down in a very claustrophobic space wanting to get out of it. 
So often when you look at function imaging, you're looking at the neural correlates of wanting to get out of here, thinking what on earth am I doing here, and so on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it is a, it, there is now this, this popularity for resting state function imaging, mm. where you're supposedly resting inside a scanner. I can tell you there's nothing restful about being inside a scanner. It's noisy, it's cramped, it, it's unpleasant. But nonetheless, what we the only the only way that we can show a change in behavior is by parameterizing it in some way. And yes, we could have had this uh, this patient play roulette. Uh, it would be much more attractive, a much more attractive experiment. Uh, you know, you could have a croupier there, etc., uh, and show that she bet differently. Mm. We could make it more naturalistic, but I'm not really sure the result would be that different. The reason I press that is because uh, Sally, Sally Sattel is not here. I'm one of the, and I'd like to sort of speak for her presence actually, because behind the observation that stimulating the nucleus accumbens, or it, it relates closely to the notion that people have addictive behavior because they have differently sensitized reward pathways in the brain. And that you can't really blame Smith for being an alcoholic or <coughs> Jones for being a cocaine addict because they've got those reward pathways which are particularly well rewarded when they take a snort of coke or whatever. And that has led to the larger idea that we should treat addictions uh, not uh, as brain diseases. And one of the things that Sally says in one of her papers is, well, let's look at some brain diseases, Parkinson's disease. Do you think the 12-step program would be any use for Parkinson's disease? Dementia, do you think you'd probably be able to reverse the dementing process if you had the 12-step program? So I guess when we think of addictions and other modes of behavior that people think are morally undesirable, we, we suppose we've got to be a bit cautious about relating it to the levels of activation in the nucleus accumbens or dopaminergic pathways and so on. Yes, my own feeling is that giving it a biological description often adds nothing. So your dopamine goes up every time you do something that you like. Well, actually, it's more sensitive to being a mismatch between what you're expecting and what you're not getting. Anyway, the point is that giving that description adds nothing. What matters is, is, it, is that behavior susceptible to being modulated by reason or by conversation or by therapy, anything other than the biological? That is the real measure, not what goes on neurologically. And sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't be. Sometimes the imaging will give you a, a predictor of whether or not it is likely that you will respond to reason. But the neural otherwise adds nothing. It's all about how does the subject respond to being engaged in that way. And that is the traditional definition of somebody as a patient versus an agent. It's when you talk to him and he doesn't do, he doesn't respond in the way that we ex expect a rational creature to respond, that we say he's no longer an agent, he's a patient. It's always a behavioral criterion. The behavioral criterion comes first. The neural comes later, and it's only helpful as an adjunct, so as an addition. But it's sometimes very helpful. Yeah. I, a colleague of mine um, uh, showed, uh, talked to me about a patient who kept robbing, kept breaking into cars in farcical situations, such as in front of a of a police station. And and his you know his approach to crime was was so absurdly primitive that. He was eventually shown to a neurologist who examined him. The neurological examination was entirely normal. But then he was scanned, and he was found to have profound frontal lobe damage. Now, when you say to this patient, why do you commit crimes in such a ridiculous fashion? He says, well, I just can't stop myself. When I see something that I want, I just have to go and get it. Now, we know that he's a patient because that's not the way that a normal criminal behaves normal criminal knows what he's doing. Um, so he's a patient before we've scanned him, but now that we've scanned him, it makes sense. Well, well, one final question. I mean, uh, you ended up with a very, very straightforward example of the fact that somebody wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't respond to the command to run because they were paraplegic. And there it's obvious what was the body's share and what was the person's share in terms of this behavior. One of the very exciting things, I think, is you're collaborating with Peter, and I guess there is a very interesting bit of work to be done to decide in principle 
how we would allocate, as it were, responsibility to persons, and or on the one hand, and identifying the brain share in behavior. Could you say a little bit about that? I mean, it's a very difficult question, but does it make sense to you? I mean, uh, yes, and I, I think ultimately, since all of behavior has to have a neural substrate at some point, it's all determined by the brain at some level. And therefore, I think the critical point here, as I say, is, is responsiveness to manipulation that's non-biological, that, that is giving reasons or taking reasons. So we would label somebody as requiring medical treatment for his addiction or whatever the problem is if he cannot respond to reasons. So it is only when somebody fails to respond in the way that a rational agent would have failed to respond that we need to invoke the medical. Until then, we proceed as if we never had MRI scans. But just as we we would not want to ignore the body that we see, just as we would not to ignore whether or not somebody has legs in, in deciding whether or not to run. So we should probably not ignore if people are lacking the substrate from which various other powers happens to depend, even if that part of the body is normally hidden. Imagine if human beings were designed in such a way that the skull was transparent. We would never have this problem. We would say, okay, well, we've spotted somebody who has that piece of brain missing, contact normally. Mm. And, and, and then th there wouldn't be this discussion. There's this discussion only because we have to do a scan, we have to look inside and so on. But that's, that's just the instrument that you use in order to get the information. It could be that that information was available directly. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed. Well, Lots of more richness there from, from Parashkev. So we now go on to the general discussion. You stay where you are, Professor, because you're going to be in the firing line. And I'm going to uh, identify your interlocutors. So, questions. Barry, I knew he'd be up first, and then Ian. So, uh, uh, yes. Microphone, of course. Okay, before, before I ask my question, I think there's something that we must just correct as a matter of record, especially because this is being filmed and it's in public. So uh, Mel Goodale's patient, Dee Fletcher, didn't put her head in an oven or try to do that. In fact, very sadly, this is a cheerful Scottish woman living in Canada and Toronto, went to a very cheap hotel with a gas-powered shower, which leaked carbon monoxide, and then went to sleep afterwards and woke up in this condition. So, so just we should just be careful about that because she's, she's not in the position that you describe. Um, I think there's a big worry when you're giving us the lessons about trees and wood because somehow or other, even as a careful neuroscientist collaborating with philosophers, you've gone immediately for the wood and not the trees when it comes to language. Now, um, I heard you say of language that's the giving and taking of reasons. And you also said words are deeds. And then with one slide, you swiftly dismiss something that's subconscious, something that, that involves deep structure, all of this stuff. Now look, this is, this is, I think, a little irresponsible and a little careless because if we know anything now about language, we know just how many levels of hierarchy are involved. And we see, for example, I listened to you speak and Ray and others in the room they will pronounce certain speech sounds differently. The actual sounds will be different. Maybe you will pronounce the same sounds differently when you're pronouncing P or B. But I have something in me which actually identifies all of those with a phoneme, which is a very abstract thing. It's not going to be something that I can map easily onto the acoustic signal, which is a continuous speech sound. If I have brain damage of a certain kind, I'm going to just hear what you produce as noise and not as speech. And so the very nature of the phenomenon you're describing, language, we might, some of us, and some people sitting very near me, might like to think of it in a certain way as a social act, but that phenomenon might be a misleading way of describing language. We might actually have to think of it as something that goes on inside us, language being internal to us, and it's because we have brains organized as we do 
that we can treat the sounds and marks we encounter as language, and if anything goes wrong, they will just return to being sounds and marks. Now, that suggests that the way language is actually working and organized, and knowing more about it, knowing how we're able to do it, might cast light on the nature of the phenomenon itself. I don't think you can be so blithe in thinking, I've got the phenomenon, I'm describing it in the wood-like way as giving and taking of reasons as deeds. Lots of people's deeds are intact when their words go missing. Warrington and Chalice, um, beautiful paper showing this sad case of a man who had lost all of his words for fruit and vegetables. This is a man who worked for the Ministry of Ag and Fish, by the way, so um, it took a long time for them to discover that. But there, 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 you, there you are, seeing as it were, yes, uh, I think as it were yeah, shelves, yeah, shelves yeah. of, of organized um, words coming out. Now, if we don't know something about that, we will have a distorted way of describing what language really is, and then we might, as you did, just dismiss all of the things it depends on. Right. Well, uh, you've just told me about a dissociation between language and action. Yeah. I've spent half the talk talking about dissociating language and action. So we're not... No, no, uh, what I'm saying is precisely that these things run in parallel. The substrate on which action depends is not necessarily the substrate on which language depends. The reason for showing the diagram with this in intermediate adventitious layer that I was talking about, the theory layer, is not that I deny the influence of elements on behavior that are not consciously made manifest. It is rather that the theory that are constructed, the, the attempt to explain these things cannot gain any purchase because they either, you either have the surface or you have the neural. And what people try to do is to interpose something between them which cannot easily be related other than simply by invoking some random conceptualization that somebody happens to choose, as of course Freud does in psychoanalysis. It doesn't have any real purchase in what is observable. That is not to say, sorry, is that working? Okay. I'm never, I have not said that it doesn't have a neural basis or that studying its neural basis is not interesting. Of course it is, that's exactly what I said. We need to look at the neural aspect. But what we have to be careful about, and that was the criticism that I was making of, uh, of the attempt to misconstrue human beings as necessarily being hierarchically organized, that everything that you do has to be accessible, intelligible, by going through that aspect of us that can take reasons and give reasons. That was my fundamental point. Not that actions can happen independently of speech. Of course they can. Not that speech does not have a neural basis. Of course it does. So where's the surface of speech that you were appealing to there? Where's the surface? What you're doing now, talking. No, what I'm doing now is making noises and sounds that you are organized to treat in a certain way. And if I was speaking in another language you don't have, there'll be noises and yeah. sounds. Uh, you're Barry, just where's the surface? You're just yeah. paraphrasing. Where's the surface? Barry, we, we, we need to ascribe that to a parallel session. Is that all right? Or a satellite session? Thank you. Okay, I think Ian was, was next, I think. Sorry. I, yeah, it's coming up. Yes. But I don't think for a moment Barashkev was denying history of neurolinguistics, with which I'm sure he's familiar. Yeah. Per Perashkiv. Sorry. <laughs> Perashkiv, I wanted first of all to, to thank you for um, saying what is obvious sense about the uh, Haynes experiment and his Bleiss and Levitt to readiness potential for what, actually. Uh, but I wanted to test you a bit further on the, um, the, the contentions you made at the, the end of your talk. Uh, obviously, one knows in cases where people are psychotic and they simply are deluded and hallucinating, um, we can point to things that are going on in their brains and we can say they don't really intend in the way that a normal human person intends the act that they may have carried out. But what about psychopaths? Um, we can look at their brains and we can say that their risk uh, reward centers are overactive. We can say their face reading centers are underperforming. We can look at their right ventromedial frontal cortex and say they have deficits in empathy. But at the end of the day, psychopaths are the people for whom, if uh, there is a word evil or there is a word bad, these are the people to whom it may be applied. And uh, the distinction you sort of came up with uh, slightly later with the help of Ray, 
was something to do with whether or not they're amenable to reason. But, if, but in fact, anybody who's ever tried to treat psychopaths will tell you there is no way that you will be able to reason these people back into another point of view. So I do think they're a trickier position for you, and I'd like to know where you stand on that. So a psychopath is defined functionally. We diagnose somebody with psychopathy on the basis of a collection of behaviors that they exhibit, thoughts and behaviors that they exhibit. And those might have a neural correlate. Now, that neural correlate might be a lot subtler than the neural correlate of somebody who has profound brain damage. But nonetheless, it may be distinctive enough for us to be able to identify them on imaging alone. And in those circumstances, I think the case would be exactly like the case of the person who has a frontal lobe lesion. However, it is a different diagnosis that the neural changes are associated with. Now, Yes, in those circumstances, you might find that attempting to modify their behavior with reason not only will not work, but you won't know that it's working because they use the therapy in order to exploit you because that's what psychopaths do. And it's going to be infinitely harder to work out that this person is amoral because they play this game. That is, that is part of the definition of a psychopath. Nonetheless, the criterion is behavior fundamentally. And if you do find a neural marker, it will be subsidiary to the behavior. The fact that the behavior is much harder to establish because nailing somebody down as a psychopath is so much harder, it's just a practical problem that we have. Fundamentally, I don't think it changes the relation between uh, brain structure and brain function and the behavioral label. that is a perfectly reasonable construction. They d have underdeveloped or damaged areas in their brains that we can identify. So should a court of law let off a cruel, sadistic, psychopathic murderer? The answer is it shouldn't be dealt with by court of law. It should be dealt with by a psychiatric institution because once we have decided that this person is to be treated as a patient, the decision about his management becomes a psychiatric one. And yes, if somebody cannot be rehabilitated, then the decisions about his management may well have long-term confinement as its dominant element. But that is a legal matter and a psychiatric matter. It's not a definitional matter about the relation between structure in the brain and the way that somebody behaves. I think they're separate. It's what we do about it, not actually are. That, that's my feeling. Thank you. I have a question in the middle of the back. And just wait for, thank you, wait for the uh, <coughs> microphone. Uh, uh, beautiful talk. I wonder if a, a humble retired neuroscientist could ask a question that may be a little bit too obvious. In the OCD patients who are receiving stimulation of the nucleus accumbens and it alters their attitude to risky behavior. Yeah, bring the microphone a bit closer. If it, you it, in the patients receiving stimulation of the nucleus accumbens and it then altering their attitude to risky behavior, is switching on the stimulation the cause of the change in their behavior? And if it is, is the activity of whichever group of neurons and fibers the stimulation affects also the cause of their normal pattern of behavior when the stimulation is off? I think all we need to say is that that specific region of the brain must have something to do with the behavior that is altered when that area of the brain is interfered with. That is not the same as saying that is the area of the brain that causes the behavior, or that is, where, that is an area of the brain in which the behavior resides. None of these things, well, they wouldn't make sense to say anyway, but we don't even have to say that. All we need to say is here is a part of the brain 
that clearly has some relation to that aspect of behavior because when we contrast states where that behavior is engaged and when it is not, we get activity in that region. And when we manipulate that region with electricity, we have a change in behavior. Why do, we, why do you want to be more precise than that? Okay, I'm happy to be so you're, what only you're that saying precise. Is switching on the electrode is the cause of the change in behavior? Well, but normal fluctuations are not the cause of the change in behavior. Just to clarify, so if somebody is on the normal risk-benefit <coughs> trade-off curve, are they also in the grip of their nucleus accumbens? Is that your question, in a sense? Yeah. Well, here there's a clear difference when you switch and when you don't switch. So the effect of the switch is to change behavior. It seems the reasonable thing to say that giving the electricity in that region does cause a change in behavior. Well, who knows whether or not it's driving it. It need not be driving it. It need not be where that impulse originates. It may be somewhere else. It's clearly part of some kind of circuit. It must be a critical node. We imagine it's a critical node because when you disrupt it, you do have behavioral consequences. But that doesn't have to mean that that is where the stimulus originates. So no, I'm not suggesting that the, the seat of gambling is the nucleus accumbens anymore, that the seat of the will is the pre-SMA. I mean, I talk too much when I'm drunk, probably when I'm sober as well. But it seems to me that I suppose what the behind your question is to say, but supposing I'm just at my normal level of talking, is this, res this the result of having, say, zero beer levels? Fluctuations in signal, all we can say is they're correlated. Mm. That's all we can say. And that is all I think what, what a neuroscientist, sensible neuroscientist would say. Where we interfere, we can say it's perhaps critical because you, you can see that there's a behavior effect when you specifically interfere with it. But that's as far as one can go. But you could imagine the OCD person who is incredibly conservative might be suffering from low nucleus accumbens activity. Yes, so yeah, I must stress that this is in the case of somebody who already has a pathological brain, of course. We can't put electrodes in normal people. It's hard to find volunteers for it. But, um, yes, g gentlemen, just by the, by the microphone. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk, and I'm very sympathetic to what you're uh, saying and that uh, the, 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 the importance of this, uh, the neuroscientific substrate for, for action. It was the end of your comments that I, I found really in equally intriguing and, and perhaps um, tremendously significant further. And that is that I, I, I'm quite nervous at defining humanity or what it means to be human simply in terms of what we do. And th that, that seems to me to, to suggest a consequentialist understanding of, of humanity. And that uh, it, it might be helpful to also talk about what we have as capacities that, and, and, I, and what I mean by that is that and you refer to rationality, and we seem to have a capacity of rationality, and, and we would need to, uh, to talk about what that means, that we are rational beings. Um, but another aspect of our, of our capacity is not simply that, that uh, we can measure what we do or we can see things that we do, but we're also creative beings, and we have a kind of, of creativity that is unique to each and every individual that can't be measured in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an empirical sense. It can influence how, how we act, um, but it's far that, that act to reduce um, our understanding or what creativity is down to what we do, I think is, is, is a, is, it's a form of reductionism that I don't think uh, we want to do. Well, I mean, I, I meant doing in a very general sense. Creating surely is a form of doing. If what you're creating doesn't involve doing, then it's not creating. 
I'm, I'm concerned that we, we identify the capacity and not just the doing. That yeah, what does it mean no. that we're able to do something that nature can't do? Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, sure, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that it's capacities. What, what I wanted to, the distinction I wanted to make is between defining something on the basis of what it's made of and defining something on the basis of how its powers are manifest. And the reason why that going on the form is dangerous for human beings is because we're increasingly replacing parts of the brain. I mean, this patient, for example, is she less of a human being because she's dependent on an electrode in her brain? No. I mean, she is in some ways partly bionic. She, her function, her normal function now depends on a piece of electronics. It doesn't matter that she has a piece of electronics inside her. What matters is that she thinks, talks, feels like a normal human being. What's in her brain is academic. Just as if we scan a large number of normal people, their brains will vary dramatically. Some of them look like you would wonder how they're walking at all. But in fact, they're perfectly normal. Sue, yes. Oh, uh, I'll come back to see if there's a lady with a, a question. Then Linda. Thank you very much. Um, I think I have a similar point as some of the people I've been touching on. And I really, I really um, appreciate the distinction that only part of us is ex explicable in talk and part of them we need to kind of to, re to rely on bodily response. Okay, and, and the other part that we need to kind of explicable only in, in brain uh, or bodily responses. Um, but I think my question is how do we, what happens when when we find it hard to distinguish which part of, of us do we explain by which manner. And kind of you were talking about how we have to see pe people as rational agents and we can distinguish between rational agents and patients by how they behave. How, who has the power to define that and what categorizes as normal behavior? And, um, and what happens to the whole idea of kind of ideology, intentionality, and beliefs in the midst of that. And I think the particular, I don't know if I'm articulating it kind of coherently, but the example I guess I'm thinking of um, is, is take um, the Norwegian terrorist Anders Bering Breivik and how he wants to say that he is ideologically motivated and not, in, not insane in what he's doing but every psychiatrist in Norway has come out with various diagnoses trying or bundles of diagnoses kind of saying what he's doing is faulty and not even take wanting to take into account his ideological beliefs and how so that yeah I think my question is like the who has the power to define all of these things and how do we negotiate it when it seems to break down well I, I mean I'm not sure it's for me to allocate that power or to make a claim that there has to be a sharp boundary. And yes, there will be a continuity as there always has been. What I'm at pains to point out is that the fact that it is a brain we're looking at doesn't change the fundamental status of what it is that we're seeing. It is exactly the same as, an, as any other kind of involuntary bodily response and any other kind of bodily feature. And just as bodily responses such as blushings are incorporated into our dealings with human beings, so and, and equally structural variations, whether we're tall, short, thin, fat, etc., so it is that functional and structural variation in brain responses and in brain structure could be incorporated into our talk, in, into the way that we inter interact. But it needs more knowledge of what the variations are knowledge of what the responsiveness of the brain is. It will always be limited because we don't walk around with fMRI scanners on our heads and so we can't easily study it in the way that we, we can detect involuntary responses and, and, and structural differences. But it's the status of those features seems to me exactly the same. The Anders Breivik case is particularly poignant for that question because obviously everyone in Norway wants to demonstrate that it was Breivik's brain that caused the problem, that he wasn't really being a Norwegian when he did it. Yes. Because it's so important. That's why his defense are actually saying, you know, he's sane. Uh, they, they have a plea of sanity, uh, which is utterly paradoxical. But I guess Norway can't bear that a sane Norwegian should behave in that way. We were talking about this yesterday, weren't we, Barry? Uh, 
So it is very interesting sometimes what, what you allocate of behavior as being due to your brain is in some sense invalidating it, you know, to use the old you know, R.D. Lang definition. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, yes. Uh, and, then, and then Andrew, yes. So, yep, Kevin Hobson, then Andrew. Yes. I'm entirely sympathetic to what you said about the test usually being a behavioral one, but I wonder if that excludes the possibility of proxies in scanning or anything else of what the brain is doing being practically useful. In other words, I can imagine somebody who was, for one reason or another, not particularly good at fine discriminations of color, not because they had a brain defect, but because they'd never really thought about it, being helped by a scanner distinguishing you know, which bits of the color underlying mechanism of their brain were active, and could say, oh, yes, now I see why you call that color such and such and this one something else. Do you think that's right? Um, well, I think you may use a scanner to establish a correlation between one thing or another. And it may well be that that might be useful in certain circumstances and not in others. I think it's key, though, always to bear in mind that in order to establish the correlation, you're led by the behavior. And I think the difficulty is that many have is that they tend to proceed from establishing a correlation to then saying, well, actually, it's the neural that's decisive because they think that it's the neural that's generating the behavior. Now, the behavior is dependent on the neural, but your grasp of the neural via an fMRI scan or any other kind of neurophysiological measure is imperfect. So it might actually miss any kind of real deterministic connection because the only way that you can use it is as a correlate. And sometimes people use it absurdly. I mean, there are people who use functional imaging in order to parameterize somebody's degree of pain so that, so that uh, they can tell how much pain the patient is in. And of course, it's not very easy to put somebody in an MRI scanner in order to get a gauge of their pain. So now what they're doing is they're correlating an EG to the MRI, which is correlated with the behavior. But why not just cut the whole thing out and just ask the guy, <laughs> are you in pain or are you not in pain? Yeah. But then they say, oh, but it's not objective. Well, what does that mean? I'm in pain? No, you, you, you're in a lot more pain than you think. <laughs> 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 uh, it's yeah. absurd. Yeah. Um, Can I pause there? Because Andrew, and you, you've got a question, yes. yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, as, as a reformed physicist, uh, I'm slightly ashamed of what my discipline has done to the world. Um, and a couple of things came, in, came into your talk I'd like to pick up on, one of which was about the determinism of the brain. If we could possibly calculate it all, perhaps we could predict our actions. You left it open, which I'm pleased about. Um, people tend to forget that, the, that this whole determinism business got started because of Newton's two-body equation, uh, two-body uh, systems. Um, it doesn't take much more complexity, it's just one more body, and suddenly the causation changes. We, get, we even get teleology and mechanics, almost no one knows this, we get teleology and mechanics. And, um, but this whole edifice of philosophy and, and has come into all kinds of areas of the humanities has been built on the behavior of two body systems. So you know, we're not obliged from physics alone to believe in determinism about the brain. It may be true, but we're not obliged to. That's, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is interesting. Gentleman back there said, "What is the cause of this?" He wanted you to. He wanted to tie you down. At what is the cause? Why should we ever believe things have just one cause? Again, that's come out of Newtonian mechanics. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, when you build a house, there are several causes. Um, so, uh, you know, just uh, uh, an apology on behalf of my discipline, and please, <laughs> please don't take it as a, as a dogma to be invoked under all circumstances. Thank you. Uh, and uh, would you accept the, you accept the apology? Yes. Uh, right, yes. Right, 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 right. Actually, I, I, uh, yes, gentlemen there. And I also want to ask Peter to respond to where Pereshkev puts talk in, in, in the human world. So I just thought you might have a view on that. But there's two more questions first. So gentlemen in the, in, in the middle there and then gentlemen down here. You just need to put the microphone nearer your mouth so the 5th century BC will I'm come into focus. I'm so yeah. glad that at last we're catching up with the 5th century BC. The Buddha very elaborately, emphatically, rationally, and convincingly 
uh, taught that human beings are primarily what they do and uh, abolished, of course, the, uh, the question of what are things made of as being of no, no uh, real importance for understanding ourselves and the world. Um, and the, uh, he abolished things and dealt only with processes, and the most important process from the humanistic point of view was the moral will. Now, I haven't quite understood your position here, and could you please comment on this, that um, the moral will is a series of choices about uh, um, things, whether we should do good or bad things, abstain from good or bad things, um, which are biased to some extent by previous choices that we've made in a chain which we can never trace the beginning of. Nevertheless, there's something very similar to the neurological doctrine that if you train a particular faculty, the part of the brain that deals with that physical faculty, say, is enlarged. Um, could you kindly comment on the Buddhist idea that, say, most of us are very inhibited about killing and we think we could never kill somebody, but so, suppose we're sent to fight in a war and we have to do it. The first time, it's traumatically difficult. The second time, it's somewhat less difficult, and so on. So that we build up moral propensities in the same way as neurologists have long shown that we build up other kinds of propensities. Uh, how does this fit in to your, uh, your view? I mean, do you have a really an interactionist view? Uh, or uh, how does it fit into your view of how the, uh, the neuroscience correlates with the behavior we can see. Well, as I say, I, I think the, the critical point is that whether or not we treat an aspect of behavior as being within the domain of the moral depends on whether or not it's susceptible to moral reasoning intersubjectively. When we talk to each other, whether we're able to take reasons in order to modify our behavior, and to modify our behavior on the basis of those reasons. To the extent to which we can do that, we're moral beings. There will be aspects of a human being where that relation does not apply. And there will be kinds of human beings that have problems in their brains or something else that do not behave like that. And the criterion, I think, for whether or not that is appropriate is what the what the human being can actually do in those specific circumstances and that specific human <coughs> being. That is the definition, not any part of its substrate. So yes, neuroscience might show that our capacity to behave morally is dependent on certain areas of the brain. I, I have no problem with that. It may well be that moral reasoning has an identifiable neural dependence. It's perfectly fine. And it may well be that we can think of something that enlarges that part of our brain and makes us more moral. It's possible. But that doesn't change the fundamental criterion for whether or not somebody's behaving morally, which is what they're like. No, but, but our moral history affects what goes on in your, from your point of view. I'm sure it does. The brain is a historical organ. So it does. That's fine. Yeah. But you think, in a way, you can translate the fact we inveterate ourselves, uh, uh, I think as Aristotle said, that that can be translated into endlessly increased facilitated pathways? Well, I, I suspect there probably won't be endless, but perhaps... Well, perhaps uh, facilitation of pathways, yeah, I should say, yeah. yes. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there's a gentleman there, and then... Uh, oh, sorry, and then this gentleman here. Sorry, do you mind if I go through that person first? So yes, and then, and then your good self. I'm sorry, I bypassed you. Thanks very much. Um, as a cognitive neuroscientist, I, I think you said towards the end of your talk that we, um, that we need to be open to reasons from outside, some words like that. Did I? Um. Um, I, I think you might have said something like, all behavior is neural substrate determined by our brains, but then you mentioned something about being, that we need to be open to reason, or, uh, something like that. And I no, I was saying is that, that, that clearly we give and take reasons aspects of us that respond in that way. N now, I'm really fascinated with that. How does giving ourselves reasons, how, how do we mesh that with being... I, I didn't mean giving ourselves reasons. Right. I, I wasn't meaning that we justify our, our behavior in, in ways that we make explicit to ourselves. Yes. I meant that we might be able to cite a reason or someone else might give us a reason yeah. for behaving in a particular way. Right. 
that, that, that's what I meant. Thank you. Right, gentleman in the front row here. Yeah, my, my question is really a, a methodological one. And it seems to me that for medi many medical science experiments that um, subjects are um, selected to an extent randomly. You know, one, one sends out letters to you know, the public through the NHS records and asks them to be involved in experiments. But for many of the experiments involved using MRI scanning, subjects are volunteers. So, you know, for example, I see regularly in the Oxford University Gazette and in dailyinfo.com in, in Oxford um, requests for being involved in experiments that involve um, MRI scanning. I mean, what impact does that non-randomness of subjects have on the kind of conclusions that one can draw from these kind of experiments? Yeah, well, the answer is that we don't know. Virtually all MRI, fMRI subjects are undergraduates graduates because actually that's the largest pool so most standard fMRI experiments are actually only applicable to the brains of, of people in their late teens early 20s and we very rarely scan anyone over the age of 30 as a standard volunteer for some reason 30 is the cutoff it's decided that at 30 you become too different it's so for fear of finding something basically maybe that's the trouble. Perhaps. Yes. Perhaps. But, uh, actually, I, I know but, Barry's. But, yeah, but yeah. yet, but nobody knows because we don't yeah. we don't have the resources. MRI is really expensive. We don't we don't have the resources to replicate experiments at different age groups. Of course, there are those who study functional MRI responses in the in people of different ages and so on. But clearly, they cannot replicate every single experiment. I mean, all experiments rely on volunteers. In that yeah. sense, there's nothing new in psychology in that respect, is there? I mean, some sometimes it can bias. Uh, a study. So, for example, there was a French group that did a study of sexual arousal in the scanner, um, and they showed uh, subjects a series of what they called validated series of, of, uh, of erotic material. I'm not quite sure validated by whom, um, <laughs> but, um, but none you of them. Yes. There were some. There were some descriptions of them, and none of them were conventional sexual experiences. Anyway, uh, and then the, the subjects were asked to rate their sexual experience as a result of seeing these 30-second clips in tiny screens inside the scanner from zero, which was the most boring experience ever, to 10, the most thrilling sexual experience of my entire life. And the average for the group was 9.5. So <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly there, was something, oh, there was something wrong with that cohort. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, Thank you. But I just want, uh, Barry definitely would come back. I just want to ask Peter, did you feel that the place of talk in, in Prajkev's sort of humanity was a bit modest? I would have thought, I, I, and I was expecting you to question that, but perhaps I misunderstood some of the things you earlier said. Well, it depends on how many of the things Prajkev said. He certainly didn't say it like you did. No. 
right now, because I can see Barry's, Barry's like a grenade with a pin working its way out. <laughs> so I, 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 I just thought I'd tease you on that particular one, but any particular, back on that at all? I mean, it sounds as if you're in total agreement in a sense, and, and the talk pervades all those other actions. You can't swagger without being a sort of linguistic sort of person. Barry, you can have the last word, because otherwise you'll never buy me another expensive glass of wine again. So okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so, so I'm still struggling to see the dialectical structu structure of your talk, because you're laying a great stress on the fact that it's our normal understanding of each other, our normal mental capacities and so on, which, which is important. It's the giving and taking of reasons that matters. And yet you gave two perfect examples of how findings from neuroscience, or in one case just behavioral psychology, undermine that. One, uh, we, the term capacity is a term of art. It's not obvious how we break down what's going on in, in our ordinary lives into perceptual intellectual capacities. Now, you gave us an example of, of uh, uh, Mel Goodale's work, Mel Goodale's work on vision, and what we find out from Dee Fletcher is that instead of it being one capacity, it's two capacities. We have the capacity vision for perception and vision for action. You'll need to leave time for the answer, Barry. No, no, no. Yeah. But they will, they will still seem to us in our experience as though it's a unified whole, but we actually see there are two capacities that can work independently in normal patients as well. And the other thing you said was um, giving of reasons, giving and taking of reasons is very important. And then you showed us Peter Johansson's work where when asked to say which, which uh, face do you find more attractive, you are given the one you didn't choose and you start giving reasons for choosing the one you didn't in fact choose and you show that choice and reason go apart. In fact, we know there's lots of experiments showing that if you're asked to give reasons for the things that you prefer and choose, it undermines your choice. So, Paresh, so what's Paresh so Paresh good, so what's you, so good you, about Paresh all Paresh you've got 30 seconds, A, to take legal advice, and B, to answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I find this question very puzzling because the whole point of my lecture was precisely that talking is a subset of a human being. And the reason why I gave these examples of things that bypass talking is precisely because it's only a subset. This is why I was talking about the neurological fallacy in the humanities, which is saying that that part of us that takes and gives reasons is only a part of a human being. So I don't quite understand your point. That is exactly what I've said. Giving reasons and taking them is important, but it's not the only characterization of a human this conversation Perhaps. will continue uh, it, uh, at lunchtime or in the police station, depending on how it goes. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it just, just remains for me to thank for our fantastic <laughs>